So a second video taking a look at our discrete probability distributions. In this case, we'll be taking a look specifically at our binomial and Poisson. If you're following along in the OpenStax textbook, you'll notice there's the geometric and the hypergeometric distributions there as well. Don't worry about those. They're not going to be covered in our course for this. Our focus is the binomial and Poisson. So just those two specific sections that you need to take a look at. Why? Why do we need these? What is the reason why this would be more beneficial versus what we had just done? Well, okay. Let's suppose instead we wanted to know, hey, what was the probability of getting 28 heads in 100 coin flips or 35 heads in 100 coin flips? Well, you saw the process that we had to go through in order to figure that out for just four coin flips, and that was quite intensive. To do the same for 100 coin flips, well, that would take us quite a bit of time. And so there's some easier ways that we can approach this, some known distributions that we can utilize in order to make this whole process easier and in order to determine the probabilities much quicker, much in a much more rapid fashion. And so our binomial distribution is going to be the first one that we're going to be taking a look at. And our binomial one really would be the one that could answer that question for us of, how could we find the probability of 28 coin flips, sorry, of 28 heads in 100 coin flips? So let's take a look at the binomial. Okay, so we're going to have our characteristics of the binomial distribution to start off. It kind of gets to thinking about, well, what's going on here? So first thing, right, okay, we have our binomial distribution. Right, by being two, right, that's why we call it a bicycle, there's two wheels. So in this case here, the two that we're talking about is that either, well, two possible outcomes. We either witness a success or we witness a failure. In this sense here, is there's two outcomes, which are either a success or a failure. These two outcomes must also be mutually exclusive. So, okay, that is you cannot have a successful failure. Right, that it doesn't really make much sense, right? You have to have either a success or a failure. So two mutually exclusive outcomes. And what we do is we denote P as our probability of witnessing a success and Q as the probability of witnessing a failure. From there, if they're two mutually exclusive outcomes, well, then it must be that P plus Q is one. There's only two success or failure, and if that's all of them, success and failure must be collectively exhaustive, so our total probability is one that we witness one or the other. Okay, second characteristic, what's happening here? All the binomial is really doing is it's just counting, it's figuring out how many successes we witness in N trials. So hey, we flip a coin a hundred times. Hey, we're interested in the probability of 28 heads. So the binomial will work that out. It says, okay, there's 28 heads. How many times do we witness 28 heads in 100 trials? So in that case there, we need to know how many trials we are considering. Uh, clearly spelling is a hard part. That is how many trials we are considering. T-R-I-A-L-S. Um, oops. <laughs> Okay, what else do we need for our characteristics here? Third guy is that the probability of success must be known and constant. So when we're flipping our coin, right, and it's for any one trial, if we just flip a coin once, we know what that probability of success is, right? We know there's a 50% chance we get a heads. We don't know, hey, what's the probability that I flip a coin 100 times and get 28 heads? Well, that's fine. We do know what the probability of success is on one trial. And we know that this probability of success is constant. So great, right? That's what we need to know here. Finally, well, finally, each trial, man, I wrote trail again. Each trial must be independent. So that is, if you get a heads on one coin toss, that does not influence whether or not I get a head on the next coin toss. Entirely independent outcomes. One has no influence on the other. So these are the characteristics of the binomial. Which then, okay, you kind of have to start asking your question as to how do I know when to use a binomial? Well, okay, some of the questions you need to kind of ask yourself are, 
can I classify my event as a success or a failure? Right? And keep in mind, a success is just what you're looking for. It might not be what you would traditionally think as a success, but it just means a successful event. That is, it's the event that you were actually wanting to have happen. Next question then, are your events independent? Does one event influence the likelihood of another event happening? If they are not independent, we cannot use the binomial. Then we need to know, hey, how many trials are being run? Are we running 20? Are we running 100? Are we running 200? Right? We need to know how many trials are being run in order to utilize the binomial. And then finally, big one, do we know what the probability of success is on any one trial? So when we were flipping a coin, yeah, we knew the probability of success was 50%. Rolling dice, we knew that the probability of rolling some value was one out of six. So okay, if we can answer those questions as yes, yes, I can classify my events as success or failure. Yes, they're independent. Yes, I know how many trials are being run. Yes, the probability of one trial is not. If that's all true, we can then carry on and we can take a look at our binomial formula. And let's take a look at that guy there. What's our binomial formula? So our binomial formula is going to say that the probability of x occurring, right, our random variable of interest, is going to be equal to, well, n combinate x times our probability of success on any one trial to the power of how many successes we're looking for. Then we're going to multiply that by Q, our probability of failure, raised to the power of our number of failures. So N minus X, right? Keeping in mind that, okay, N is our number of trials altogether. N equals number of trials. X, this is the number of successes that we're interested in witnessing. Hey, what's the likelihood that we witness three heads and four coin flips? P is our probability of success, and Q is the probability that we fail. Keep in mind, hey, if these two are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, well, Q also just equals one minus P, right? Because P plus Q equals 1, so 1 minus the probability of success is our probability of failure. So, okay, let's, let's test this formula. Let's make sure that it's all what it cracks up to be. And that is we already worked out, hey, the probability of three heads in four coin flips. What was that? Probability of three heads? That was something like 25%. If this formula is as we claim it to be, we should be able to work this through much quicker and easier than that long, long process we went through before. So let's put in our values. What do we have? Well, we're going to have four coin tosses. We want to know probability of witnessing three heads, right? So heads is the successes that we're concerned with. Probability of success, flipping a coin, that's a 50% chance. Probability of failure. Well, that's a 50% chance, right? 50, 50 equals one. So, okay, let's work that out. Probability that X equals three is gonna be four combinate three times probability of success, 50% to the power of, how many successes do I want? Three times probability of failure, well, that's another 50%. To the power of my number of failures, well, okay, if I have four trials and three successes, I'm saying one of those successes is a failure. So working that out, best to work these out in their three parts and then multiply those three parts together. I find that typically we have the fewest number of calculation errors when it's done in this way. So, okay, first bit, four combinate three. Well, if we do four combinate three, we get four. So four combinate three gives us four. Next, we want to consider 
0.5 to the power of 3. And that gives me 0 0.125. And then 0 0.5 to the power of 1, well, that's just 0.5. Working all this out then, what do we have? We have 4 times 0 0.125 times 0 0.5. And all of that works out to give us probability that x equals 3 is 0 0.25. Hey, would you look at that, right? We got the same result as we did when we actually worked through this long form by hand. So, hey, if I was given the choice between doing it that long form, figuring out all my collectively exhaustive outcomes, counting them up, creating a frequency table, figuring out that probability, or just using my, my binomial formula, uh, my binomial formula seems like a bit of an easier one to utilize. So, yeah, this guy here, much nicer to be able to work through than figuring out all of those cases on their own. So binomial formula helps to really make things a lot easier, makes things a lot quicker altogether. What we can do then, we can also take a look at, hey, well, we went through and we figured out, hey, what was our mean of X? What was our standard deviation of X? And we had to go through that whole process, right? We said, okay, mean of X was the summation of X times the probability of X. And so for all of our possible outcomes, we had to do this and then sum it and it could be time consuming. But lucky for us, lucky for us, the binomial is a known distribution. And as such, the mean and our standard deviation kind of have fixed kind of rules to them. And that is our mean, it just works out to be n times p. So n number of trials times p probability of success. So hey, if we work that out, number of trials, we flipped a coin four times. Probability on any one trial was 50%. That gives me two. Again, that lines up with what we calculated in that last example where we did it all by hand. So things are still lining up. What about our standard deviation? Well, our standard deviation is just the square root of the variance still. And so square root of the variance. And we could say that that there is one and the same as our variance of the binomial would be n times p times q. So, okay, what's, what's that? n being our number of trials. P being the probability of success, Q being the probability of failure. What does that guy work out to for us then? Well, four trials, 50% chance that we get it right, and 50% chance that we fail. So what does that work out to? Four times 0.5 is two, two times 0.5 is one. We get the square root of one, square root of one is one. So one heads, two heads. Hey, this is again exactly what we worked out before. A little bit of an easier process than doing that summation of square deviations from mean times the probability of x. All right, that took a lot longer to work through. If we can say, yeah, we're dealing with a binomial distribution, our kind of characteristics, our conditions are met, our assumptions are sat satisfied, two outcomes, success or failure, the two outcomes are independent. The two outcomes, or sorry, successive trials are independent. Our two outcomes are mutually exclusive. Great. We can use the binomial here, and things become much easier to be able to work with. Well, let's take a look at an example as to how we can utilize this and uh, kind of help, you know, take a look at another way at really why this works out so, so nice. So in this case here, let's suppose that you are about to write a multiple choice test. So you're about to write a multiple choice test, right? Typical multiple choice test. You have A, B, C, or D. And out of these four outcomes, you have to pick the one correct answer. Well, let's presume that there are 20 questions and you did not study. You have no idea what any of the correct answers are. That is, you're hoping to go and take this midterm and be like, hey, 20 questions, A, B, C, D, 
Well, okay, I'm just going to guess on each one. 25% chance I get a question right. And let's work out what uh, my likelihood is that I pass, right? Well, okay, first let's work out, hey, what's the probability that I get a score of 65% on this midterm? So, okay, 65% on the midterm, what's, what's that? Well, there's 20 questions, so what is that going to work out to? 65 times 20. So we can work that out quite easy. 20 times 0.65 is going to be 13. So that is really what we're saying is, hey, what's the probability that we get 13 out of 20 questions right? So, okay. We have 20 questions. We want to know probability of getting 13 of them right. And I know the probability of getting any one right as 25%. I also know then the probability of getting any one wrong as 75%. We can work through that then. So that's going to be 20, combinate 13. Now uh, let's uh, back up. Let's write that a bit better. 20, combinate 13. Okay, then we're going to work out our probability of success of 25 to the power of the number of successes, 13. Our probability of failure of 75 to how many failures are we going to witness? 20 questions, 13 right. Well, that's going to mean seven of them are wrong. Okay, let's uh, bring this guy down. Let's work through this. What is that going to give us? That's going to be 20 combinate 13. Uh, 77, 5, 20. So, okay, good, good amount happening there. 0.25 to the power of 13. That's, that's going to be quite, quite a small number. 0 0.00000014. Right, in this case here, if you have your store function on a calculator, this is where the store function works out to be quite well, because you don't have to write this down. You can just say, okay, we're going to store this as something like answer one. And then our next guy there, right, we'll store that as answer two. And then we'll work all through these individually as we get those values. So, okay, we have our result for 0.25 to the 13. 0.75 to the power of 7. Well, okay, we don't really need to store that guy. That guy is actually not too bad. We can write that one down. That one's going to be 0 0.1335, right? We'll carry around a few extra decimal places. So, okay, let's work through this. We're going to have 77,520 times my answer 1. So that answer 1 times 0.1335. What's my probability of getting 65% on this exam? That is getting 13 out of the 20 questions right. 0 0.0015. All right, so, okay, what is that as a percent? That's 0.01%. That's a tenth of a percent chance that you could get 65% on this test just by guessing. So, okay, not very likely. What about if we just wanted to work out instead, hey, what's your probability of passing this test, right? That is, what is your probability that X is greater than or equal to 10? Well, okay, if we have independent, mutually exclusive events, this is just going to be our special addition rule. That is, it's just going to be probability that x is 10. Probability that x is 11. Probability that x is 12. Probability that x is 13. Right, and then we could continue on probability that x is 20. And we could keep working through these on and on and on and on. And we could figure out, hey, what is my probability of scoring over 
But okay, let's uh, let's work through these. So okay, if we work through right our binomial formula for each one, so that would be uh, twenty combinate ten probability of success twenty five ten successes probability of failure ten failures. We could work that out to be probably like at fifty percent zero zero nine nine. Right, so almost almost one percent chance that we get fifty percent. We could do the same thing here. We could go okay, twenty combinate eleven times zero point two five to the eleven, zero point seven five to the nine, and we'll get zero point zero zero three. Carry on. We do that to the twelve, and we get zero point zero zero. 7, 13 was 0 0.001, and then I purposely kind of just done dot, 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 because you see we're kind of getting ridiculously small at this point. At 14, we are essentially 0. 15, 0, on and on and on and on. All right, so in that case there, when we go to take the summation to say, okay, probability of 10 or more is just probability of 10 plus probability of 11, on and on and on and on. All we actually have to do is just add up really these guys because these guys are negligible. So what do we get? What do we get is our probability or likelihood of passing this 20 question multiple choice just by test, just by guessing? Well, we get that to be 0.0. .0 uh, we're going to say 138, so let's just go 0.014. That is 1.4% 1 chance that you could actually pass a 20 question multiple choice just by guessing. So, okay, not, not very likely. Let's suppose that you were, though, in the habit of taking tests in this way. What would be your expected value? What would be your typical test score if you were to continually take 20 question multiple choice tests strictly by guessing? Well, on average, you would receive a score of n times p, right? That's our mean of our binomial. And we have 20 questions. You have 25% chance of getting it right. So that gives us five. That is, on average, you would get five out of 20 questions right. So on average, you'd get about a 25% grade. What's our standard deviation of that result, right? What's our, right? on average, you get 5%, but you might be a little bit more, you might be a little bit less. Where are you likely to fall? Well, okay, standard deviation, that's gonna be the square root of n times p times q. So that's gonna be, what does that work out to? That's gonna work out to be one point nine four so okay uh, how do we interpret that if you were to take a test just by guessing we would expect that your grade right so your number correct would be five plus or minus 1.94 questions right so that is almost plus or minus two if we rounded that a bit, if we said, okay, plus or minus two to kind of think about it in this whole number kind of way, if you were to continually take tests just by guessing and saying, okay, hopefully this is the right one, same one, next one, okay, hopefully this is the same one, we would expect that your score, your number correct, would be somewhere between three and seven, right? I would expect that typically you'd get between three and seven questions right on a typical exam. That's where the bulk of this distribution will lie. If we want to take a look at kind of what this would look like, we could work it out all together. I'm just going to kind of give a rough idea. If we did, okay, here's our X number correct. We would get between zero and 20. We saw that really come around 10, you're getting pretty close to zero. Um, and we saw that, what, five here? Five was our average. Your distribution, I'm gonna draw just a continuous one, but right, keep in mind it would be a bar chart. It would look something like this. So 
such that, okay, most of the time, right, you're getting pretty low. You'd have your average grade here. There's your average grade of five out of 20. And you'd typically fall within plus or minus two. So down to three, up to seven. This is where you would typically end up falling. And we see that this distribution would be highly skewed to the right. And the reason why this distribution would be highly skewed to the right in this case is because, well, our number of successes is going to be bounded between zero and our n number of trials. The lower the probability of success, the more we're going to be bulked up near the zero. The higher the probability of success, the more we're going to be bulked up around n. If we have a probability of success kind of in the middle, well, then we'll be roughly symmetric and we'll be sitting in the middle there. If you want to take a look at this, uh, we can take a look at what that looks like. So let's say we had a low number of successes. We would expect a distribution to be looking something like that. All right, so here I have a probability of success of 10%, n of 20. We see that, okay, we're bulked up. They're all close to zero. We don't really get much success after five. If we take a look at our probability of success of n equals five, sorry, of probability of success of 50%, still n of 20, well, we see that we're a lot more symmetric now, right? Very unlikely we witnessed 20 out of 20 successes. Very unlikely we witnessed zero successes. Most of the time we witnessed right around 10. When our probability of success is really high, well, in this case here, our distribution shifts towards the n, we become skewed to the left, and that is in this case here, well, most of our cases, our most likely case that we have is lots of successes, high probability of success, very unlikely that we have a low number of successes. So we can kind of view the shape of this distribution, how it kind of transitions from being skewed to the right, symmetric, skewed to the left, based off of how the probability of success changes. So shape of the binomial. Let's take a look at one more question. And with this one more question, we'll kind of work through a little bit more with it as well. And let's take a look at that. Okay, let's take a look at one more example using our binomial distribution. And so in this case here, we'll use a bit of a local example. Uh, we'll presume, well, we won't presume, on the island highway between, uh, if we're driving north between Goldstream, uh, Goldstream and Parksville, right? So keep in mind, this is the highway between Goldstream and Parksville. This is about a 140 kilometer stretch, just for reference. That's not necessarily important to our question. On this stretch of highway, we have in total 42 traffic lights. Yes, yes there are, I counted. So, okay, 42 traffic lights in between Goldstream and Parksville on the highway. Let's presume that the probability of getting a red light at any one, so your probability of getting a red light at any one light is 20%. Farther, right, in order to be able to do this, we're going to presume that these lights are independent from each other. That is, hey, if I get a red at one, it does not influence my probability of getting a red at another. So, okay, they're not timed or anything like that. Yeah, that may be true. That may be a bit of a grand assumption. We'll have to, uh, we'll have to just assume it, though, just the same. Based off this, we have a few questions that we're interested in figuring out. First one, well, on an average trip up island, how many lights am I going to be stopped by? So, on average, average number of reds. But then I want to know, okay, that's my average number of reds. What, uh, what's kind of my plus or minus one on any typical trip, right? What's my high end? What's my low end as to what I can typically expand? Um, so, what is my, we'll go, Average plus or minus one standard deviation. So, okay, right, if we want to use our actual term terminology, that is, we're trying to find the mu 
Oh, I just gave you a hint there of our binomial. And we want to know the standard deviation. So we want to know the sigma of our binomial. That hopefully wasn't too big of a hint. We've been looking at the binomial. It's really the only tool we have in our toolbox. So that should be her big one that we're utilizing. Uh, once we find the average, once we find the standard deviation, what we want to do is we want to create a frequency table. So a frequency table showing all of our different probabilities and a bar chart. So the bar chart, just so that we can visualize the distribution, see how it falls, see which, uh, which number of red lights is our most likely down to our least likely. Then what we want to do, some actual finding some probabilities. Hey, what is the probability that we are stopped at? So probability that red equals 12, that we're stopped at exactly 12 lights versus a hey, what's our probability that we get, what was I asking here? Probability that we get fewer than four red lights. So, okay. Two questions to work through. This is again going to be one of those situations where I'm going to say, hey, pause the video, work through these, all jump to the next page. I'm not going to work through all of these questions, but I will post the answers to them. And so pause the video. In a second, we'll jump through and take a look at the answer to each of these questions. Okay, so we have our results here. First of all, what's our average number of reds on this trip up island? Typically, how many red lights am I expected to hit? Well, okay, that's just mu of the binomial is NP. Our N was 42, our P was 0 0.2. That gives us 8.4 reds. Being on a typical trip, what we would be expected to hit. So right, a little bit closer to 8, but kind of cycling between 8 and 9 reds in this case. What's our plus or minus 1 standard deviation? Well, we know what our standard deviation is, which is 2.59 reds. And that's saying that, okay, yeah, our average is 8.4, but the typical plus or minus one, well, on a typical trip, we could get just under what? That's about six, just below six, 5.81, or almost 11. So that's our kind of typical band, the deviation that we'd be expecting to witness around that average of 8.4. So, okay, yes, typically I'd be expected to hit 8.4 lights, but my high probability is really truthfully somewhere between 6 and 11, we'll say, just to round that to whole numbers, but technically 5.81 to 10.99. We then want to create a bar chart, and well, frequency table and then bar chart. So what I've done is I've gone and just created that here and copied it over. Keep in mind the way that we did this, the way that we calculated each of these probabilities, was each one of these was just probability that x equals, let's say, 0. And that was going to be 42 combinate 0 times our probability of success. This is where sometimes things can get funny because you're like, what, a red light's a success? Yeah, it's what we're interested in. So 0.2 is our success to 0 successes. And then 0.8 to 42 failures. And we get our probability that x equals 0 of essentially 0, right? Essentially, there's no chance. There is a slight chance there, but I round it to three decimal places. So it's essentially there's no likelihood of us actually getting that whole distance without getting a single red light. As we go up, we see that our probabilities increase. Of course, our probability is kind of at its maximum. Our most likely scenario is at 8 right between right eight and then a little bit at nine. Shouldn't really be that surprising given that our average outcome was 8.4. So yeah, our most likely outcome in this case to 1 point, sorry, 15.3%. And then we kind of peter off back towards zero. I stopped the frequency table at 19. I didn't have to do it for the entire 42 possible red lights. Because as soon as we started to hit zero, we just were at zero forever forward into the future. So that's our that's our frequency table. Our bar chart then, well, we could just create a bar chart from this. And you could just put in height based off of each of these probabilities. You could again truncate your x-axis such that it started at zero but ended at, say, 1920. 
something like that. I mean, you could have ended it at 18 if you wanted to, such that, hey, past that point, we don't really have any data of interest. Okay, what about these last two bits here? What's our probability that we get 12 red lights? What's the probability we get fewer than four red lights? Well, now that we have this table, it's just looking this stuff up. So probability that we have 12 red lights. Well, hey, there's 12. Probability that I get that, 0 0.056. That is a 5.6% chance I get exactly 12 red lights. What about the probability I get fewer than four? So fewer than four, that's not including four. That's gonna be that I get three or less. So what's that gonna be? 0 0.015, 0 0.005, 0 0.001. Okay, right, the key there, what's the probability that I get three or less, well, or, so that's gonna be triggering our addition rule. In this case here, we have mutually exclusive events. So what am I getting? I'm adding these all up, right? I don't need to worry about that joint probability. It's just adding these all up, 0.015 plus 0.005, that's gonna be giving me 0 0.020. And then 0 0.001, that's going to give me all together 0.021. So about a 2.1% chance that we get less than four lights. And we have all of our solutions to this question. All right, this part here, creating this frequency table, this is the most labor intensive part. What we'll see, I'll be posting a few videos after this fact as well. Hey, we took a look how to do this by hand. Yeah, okay, it's better than working through it all using our classical sense. Well, this would be tough to do in the classical sense. It would be more empirical. But our binomial formula solves this for us, but it's time consuming. The next video that I'll be posting is going to be on how to calculate these probabilities using Excel, using R, using the stats program of your choice and you can take a look at a more rapid way to solve these kind of questions. Because yeah, calculating this binomial 19, 20 times, it's, it, it becomes exhausting for sure. But before we get there, carrying on in this video, we're gonna jump over and take a look at our next discrete probability distribution, our Poisson distribution. So let's go take a look at the Poisson next. Okay, well, we've already taken a look at our binomial distribution, such that our binomial distribution was telling us, hey, what's the probability of witnessing X successes in N trials? Well, okay, that was our binomial. So we need to know, okay, how many successes we were looking for and how many trials or experiments we were running all together. We then had to have these outcomes be one of two situations, right? Binomial two situations, such that they had to either be a success or they had to be a failure. So that was the idea of our binomial. What we're moving on now is our Poisson. For our Poisson, we don't actually need to know how many trials we are running. That is, we're not actually technically running trials with our Poisson. What we're looking at is we're looking at the number of successes over some fixed interval of either time or space. So, hey, over um, 100 pages in a book, how many typos are we going to witness on average if we were the editor of this? Uh, additionally, we could take a look at, hey, if typically on average we have two late flights a day, well, how? what's the probability of witnessing three late flights on a certain day? Right, so over some area of time or space is what the Poisson is looking at. What we need to have is we need to know what the average rate of occurrence is over that time period. So with that, let's take a look at our characteristics of our Poisson distribution. And our characteristics, first of all, well, our events need to be independent, right? This is a fairly common theme. So if we're talking about, right, like we said here, typos on a page, well, our events are independent. If I make a typo on one page, it doesn't influence my probability of making a typo on another page. 
Next thing there is that events happen at a known average rate. That is right, typically or on average, we get five per page, or typically on average, we get two late flights a day, or on average, a car suffers a mechanical failure in 100,000K, right? That's one failure every 100,000K. So we have some average rate of occurrence. Next one there, the random variable X. So that's what we're looking for, right? What's the probability we have three typos on this page or something like that? That would be X. Three typos is what we'd be looking at. X is the number of times the event occurs in the fixed interval, right? So, okay, that's, that's what we're typically looking for. Next one, the intervals are independent and they don't overlap, right? So, okay, if we're looking at two late flights a day, well, okay, we have boom one day. And if we have five late flights in one day, that doesn't influence the likelihood of the next day. And the days are discrete time periods. They don't overlap with each other. They're just boom blocks in time or space. They're not overlapping. They're discrete. Finally, Ah, uh, we are proportional to the size of our interval, right? So, okay, if we worked out, hey, we have five typos per page, well, then we could also say that on average we have 10 per two pages. If we have two late, two late flights a day, well, we could say that we have 14 late flights a week, right? So we can work through things in this proportional way, and that is a useful little characteristic that we'll take advantage of quite regularly when working through the Poisson. Okay, so... We took a look at kind of when to use the binomial. Very similarly, you'll want to use the Poisson when, again, your events are independent. But okay, that doesn't really help you differentiate between should I use the binomial or should I use the Poisson because you needed that for both. So okay, the next, next little trick here is to when to use the Poisson. This kind of helps you differentiate. Do I pull the binomial out of the toolbox or do I pull the Poisson out of the toolbox? And this differentiation here, this, uh, this point is you'll want to use the Poisson when your events are over space and time. You want to use the binomial when you're looking at, hey, how many events, how many successful events do I have in some number of trials? So binomial, hey, successful events in n trials, Poisson, successful events over space or time. Finally, with the Poisson, with the Poisson, sometimes we'll have more than two outcomes, right? The binomial was limited. We could either have a success or a failure. Well, Poisson could actually have an infinite number of outcomes. We just have the one that we're interested in, and we're looking at that one over time. So all that being said, let's introduce the formula. Let's introduce how we would calculate the probability with the Poisson and talk about what all the variables mean and start playing around with it a bit. So our Poisson distribution, right? Let's write that down. Our Poisson distribution probability that x occurs is going to be lambda to the power of x times Euler's constant to the power of negative lambda all over x factorial. So, okay, we've got a whole bunch of new letters, variables popping in there. Let's, uh, let's talk about what they mean. So, first one there. First one, let's just start with x. x is our discrete random variable of interest, right? Discrete random variable of interest. That is, hey, I want to know what's the probability that I have three successes. Well, then x equals three, or when we work out probability of x equals three, right? So, okay, not, not so revolutionary there what x is. Our next guy there, lambda. What's what's this lambda guy? Well, lambda is what we are going to use, what we're going to utilize to notate the mean or the average occurrence. Uh, the average rate of occurrence. Right? So in the previous kind of questions, uh, example that we were looking at when we were evaluating our characteristics, we said, hey, on average, there's five typos per page. Well, in that case there, lambda would be five if we were saying, hey, there were five typos per page. So lambda, the average rate at which our event occurs over that period of time or space. Uh, this also can be found out, right? Our average, this is also the average of the Poisson distribution. It is very similar to the binomial. It's just n times p. So if we knew how many trials were there altogether, 
and we knew what the probability was in any one of them, yeah, we could work out the average in that case there as well. Last guy there, okay, so that's lambda check, x check. What's this e? Well, this e, this is Euler's constant. Euler's constant. This is a lesser known constant by many, right? Many of you know pi. Pi equals 3.14, on, 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 on. Euler's constant, right? Kind of same idea. It's just another universal constant out there. And Euler's constant is approximately, right? Just like pi is approximately 3.14. This is approximately 2.71828. Right? And again, if you ever forget that, you're like, oh my goodness, do I need to remember this Euler's constant? Typically, your calculator, just like it, your calculator has a button for pi, typically your, but your calculator does have a button for Euler's constant. Um, very rarely is it just the explicit button. Usually, you have to hit a second function in order to get there. So take a look at your calculator. See if you can find where that is. If not, yeah, okay, memorize 2.71828. And that's going to be enough decimal places for the stuff that we're working with. So, okay, there's our parts of our Poisson distribution. Very similarly, we can work out the mean of the distribution. We can work out the variance of our Poisson distribution, just like we did with the binomial, right? We took a look at the distribution and we said, hey, the average success that we witnessed was blank. Very similarly here, we can work out the average of this Poisson distribution to be equal to lambda. That is equal to NP. Our variance, well, our variance is going to be, again, equal to lambda, which is, again, equal to NP. That is, our variance and our mean are identical in this case. So if we wanted to work out the standard deviation, well, the standard deviation, sorry, let's uh, jump down. Our standard deviation of the Poisson, then, is just going to be the square root of lambda or square root of NP. And that will be our standard deviation of the distribution. Okay, we have kind of the tool in mind here. We know the basics, the workings of the tool. Let's actually go to the next example. Let's see how we actually use this tool in practice and work out a probability. Let's take a look at that next. Okay, let's take a look at an example using our Poisson distribution. So let's suppose that uh, uh, let me just uh, let me just copy this over and we can just take a look at it all together. Okay, so taking a look at this question, on average, a vehicle built before 95 will have a mechanical failure every two years. Assuming that any failures are independent, what is the probability that we have no failures in a given year? So, okay, right, in this case here we're talking about, okay, a number of failures, mechanical failures we witness, but right, the big thing you'll notice is we're not talking about how many trials we're having. Like, hey, We'll have, I mean, I don't even know how failures would work in number of trials, right? So in this case here, we're very clearly talking about a Poisson. But this really is going to be the struggle for many with the course, is that very rarely will a question actually tell you, hey, use the Poisson to solve this question, or use the binomial to solve this question, right? Very often, like in real life, your boss isn't going to say, hey, I have this problem, use this tool to fix it. No, 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 no. The boss is going to say, hey, I have this problem. Can you solve it? You need to figure out what tool to use. And that's going to be the same thing as we go through in the course. And that's where the course becomes increasingly difficult is just strictly because you get more and more tools in your toolbox and you have to do some problem solving as to which tool I need in this scenario. So, okay, we just introduced the Poisson. So clearly this is a Poisson question. Again, how to figure that out. We're looking for some probability of some event happening over time and space. So over time and space, that's kind of our good hint that it's Poisson. Right, additionally, it's a discrete variable. Number of failures, we're counting our failures. We have one, two, three, four. It's a discrete random variable. So a discrete random variable kind of blops us down. It has to be either binomial or Poisson. That time and space bit, that gives us that it's a Poisson. So what are we looking for? We are looking for the probability that x equals zero but okay here's here's the big uh, the big kicker probability we have no failures in a given year what's our uh, what's our lambda 
our lambda is that we will have a mechanical failure every two years. So, okay, we have a different unit of measurement between what our current rate is, our average rate of occurrence, versus what we're asking. So this is where we have to kind of keep in mind the whole idea that we have this proportionality between things. So, hey, if we have one mechanical failure every two years, well, over our time frame of interest, we're going to have 0.5 mechanical failures every year, right? So, okay, we can work that out then as well. So let's throw in our values. Lambda is 0.5. That's the only really one we need to know other than the probability we're interested in. So we're going to have... 0 0.5 to the power of x, x is 0, times Euler's constant. So I'm just going to put Euler's constant to the negative uh, lambda. What was lambda? 0 0.5. All over x factorial, so all over 0 factorial. And what does that work out to? You might be looking at this, you're like, oh no, 0 factorial. We can't divide by 0. Right. Keep in mind, by definition, we introduced this back in the last few videos, 0 factorial equals 1. So, no, we're not dividing by 0, we're dividing by 1. We get 0 0.6065. So, okay, that is that our probability that we have 0 breakdowns in one year is going to be... 60%. So 60.65%, right? So there's, yeah, there's not really that big of a chance of us having a mechanical breakdown in a given year. What's our next one? What's the probability that we have, uh, the probability that you have a single failure in a year, right? So in that case there, we're looking at, hey, what's the probability that x equals 1? Well, okay, we can just update this guy. Still the same mean, but now to the power of 1 times Euler's to the negative 0.5 and all over 1 factorial. Okay, what do we have? 0.5 to the 1, that works out to be 0.5. Here's the nice little thing. Euler's to the negative 0.5, that's going to be 0 0.6065. And then what are we doing? We're dividing by one factorial. One factorial is one. So what do we get as our probability of one failure? Our probability of one failure is 0 0.3033. So about, about a 30% chance that we witness a single failure in a given year. Not, not so bad. Okay, final one here. What is the probability that you have more then uh, that should be more than one failure in a given year, right? There's my uh, one typo per page. What is the probability that you have more than one failure in a given year? So probability that X is greater than one, right? And so, okay, what are we doing in that case there? Let's just scroll down. That's like probability, right? Keep in mind, probability that X is two or X is three or X is four, right? So we'd be looking at, hey, what's the probability that x equals 2? What's the probability that x equals 3? On and on and on and on. Now in our binomial case, we just had to go till n. But here's the problem with the Poisson. We don't have some number of trials, right? Technically, we could have an infinite number of trials going on here. So do we go all the way till, like, probability of x equals 9,999? And then, right? No, 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 no. We, we don't have to do this. Right, we don't need to do this for two reasons. First, even if you did go this route, very quickly you're going to start to get probabilities equal to zero. So, okay, you can stop in that case there. Right, so as soon as you start getting zero, zero, really close to zero, you're good, you can stop. On the other side of things, we can kind of use our complement rule, if we remember that from the last bit. All of these events are mutually exclusive. So, hey, Probability that x is greater than 1, well, if we looked at probability that x is greater than 1, or the probability that x was less than or equal to 1, that is, right, probability that we have any possible value that we could witness, that's going to be 100%, right? There's a 100% chance, 1, 
that we're going to hit something between zero and infinity. That's what this is saying. This is saying bigger than one. This is saying less than one. And so we have one there. That is, right, we could work this around because, hey, this or, that's just a plus. We could work this around to say, hey, that the probability that x is greater than one, that's just going to be one minus our probability that x is less than or equal to one. That is what we really have to do to solve this. We don't have to solve a whole bunch. We just need to work out what's my probability that x is less than or equal to one. Well, that is probability that x equals one. That is my probability that x equals zero. Equals equals, using our special addition rule, we sum them together and we get our probability. But hey, 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 wait a minute. We just calculated x equals one. We just calculated x equals zero. So what was that? 0 0.3033. 0 0.6065. So what does that give us? 0 0.3033 plus 0 0.6065 is going to give us 0 0.9098. Okay, so that's our probability that we have one or fewer breakdowns in a given year. So then what's the probability we have more than one? Well, one minus 0.908. And we'll get probability that x is greater than 1 being equal to 0 0.0902. And we have from that the probability that we have more than one breakdown in a given year. And it's just, just under 10%. So not too bad there. Not too bad at all. Let's take a look at our final question, example question that we'll have for the Poisson. And we'll leave the video after that. Okay, here we have our final question for the Poisson. On average, any given household in BC can expect to have 1.8 power outages a year. Okay, we want to know then, hey, what's the probability of having no outages? What's the probability of having three outages? And what is the probability of having at least two outages? Finally, let's create a frequency table and a histogram of this probability. Okay, to be honest, what I would do is I would go and create that first. Bad terminology. Frequency table and bar chart of this probability distribution. Right, there we go. Bit of a correction there. Okay, so in that case there, I would do this first one first, creating the frequency table, because keep in mind once we create this frequency table, well, we have all of these probabilities just popping out. So what I'll do again, last question for Poisson, pause the video, you work through this, you see where you get to, I'll throw the answers up, I'm not necessarily going to work through them, just throw the answers up, you can compare your result to my result. So pause now, answers in a second. Okay, working through our Poisson, we see we didn't have to go very far before we hit zero, we only had to calculate eight, right? That was a lot better than when we were doing our binomial case with the red lights where we had 42, but we had to calculate about 19 of them. So a little bit better in this case here. The Poisson also is arguably an easier mathematical one to calculate. So, okay, from here, we're just gonna reach out. Uh, what is the probability of having no power outages? Well, probability of X equals zero, that's gonna be 16.5%. Probability we have three power outages. Well, that's probability that x equals three. So that's 16.1%. What is the probability that we have at least two outages? So that is saying two or more. Well, to get that, we're just gonna to have to sum from 0.268 bigger. So 0.268 plus 0 0.161 plus, right on and on and on and on. And we get our probability that x is at least 2 to be uh, 50, 53.7%, 0.537, meaning that, yeah, okay, it's, it's fairly likely we'll have at least two outages in a given year. From here, right, we have the frequency table. Check. That was the easy way to get these above ones. Sometimes it's best to not do the question in order. And then from this frequency table, well, we could then create the bar chart, right, such that we would have 
Horizontal axis is our values of x, our number of outages. Vertical axis is probability of x. And we would have our heights being this guy there. So if I were just to quickly freehand this without scale, what would we get? We'd have something like, ah, a little bit bigger than that. What am I doing? Uh, 16.5, what's our highest value? 29. So, okay, we have a little bit of scale just so we can kind of get an idea. Something like that. Like that. Right, we get a bar chart that's something like this, right? So we get the basic idea as to how it is. And yep, our kind of mean would be right about there, 1.8. That is our mean of our Poisson distribution. And we see spikes initially, falls off. That is this distribution, given this, is also skewed to the right. That is, it has a positive skew to it. Right, and right, you're like, oh my goodness, skew, we haven't talked about that for a while. No, no, but we have, right? It all carries forward, right? In fact, if I wanted to, I could throw at you, hey, what is the value of the skew of this distribution? And you actually have the tools that you could solve that, right? You'd have to find the median based off of this, hey, what's our middle value? And then work through, okay, mean minus median, three times mean minus median, all over the standard deviation, we know standard deviation of x, right? That's going to be the square root of the variance, which is just the square root of lambda. So square root of 1.8. So right, we have all the information we need in order to calculate the skew. If that was part of it, we could work it out. But that does us for Poisson. A little bit of a work through it question. Let me know if you have any questions on any of our discrete random variables or our discrete probability distributions. This does us for today. The only videos left to remain is to how to calculate this using a stat software such as Excel or R. They're pretty short videos. There's not much to them. So we'll drill those up shortly and you can take a look at those to save some time from doing it by hand. Until next time.